Okay, so uh, thank you, Alina, for such an extensive introduction. Um, so uh, now she has already introduced me, but I will still say some things. So uh, I'm Vishalam, and I am a postdoctoral researcher in Fitzkarlsruhe Leibniz Institute for Information Infrastructure and in Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. So uh, today uh, I'm going to talk about graph representation learning. <clears throat> so uh, uh, we all already know that deep learning has been applied to many kinds of data resources. For example, you see here images where you perform image recognition with the help of deep learning approaches. Then you have seen uh, speech recognition algorithms. And then for the natural language, you have several algorithms for classification. If we go more advanced, we have misinformation detection and these kind of algorithms for textual data. So today in this uh, lunch lecture, uh, I'm going to talk mostly about graphs here. So I hope you are you will be able to relate, relate it to your research also. So I'm going to give some examples. So uh, I hope uh, you enjoy the whole lecture here. Um, so just to give you an overview of where do graphs exist. So I think you would, uh, you already know that in social networks, you have one person connected to another or one person following the other one. So this way it creates a graph here. So the nodes are the person and the link between them is if you are following them or you are friends with them. And then you use this information to possibly give the recommendations about new friends uh, with the help of machine learning approaches. Similarly, some things can be done in the uh, area of protein-protein interactions where proteins are the nodes and the interaction between them are the links. And the last one, I actually took it from the slides of Eline, uh, Eline and it's about authors and printers. So you can see that this is, uh, this is another one of the examples. So uh, for the deep learning approaches, the idea here is to learn representations from these kinds of graphs that we just discussed. So this is just a general representation. So the idea here is that if two nodes are occurring close to each other in this graph here, they will occur close to each other in this vector space also. So we are trying to project these, uh, these graphs into a geometric representation. So here, uh, if two nodes are occurring close here, as I said, they will be closer to each other here. And then you can use them, use this uh, cosine similarity or vector-based similarity to find similarities between these uh, nodes. This can further be used as node classification. I will also use uh, tell you another application later on which we use for a sort of type prediction, but uh, we will talk about this later. So one thing to notice here is that there, there are nodes, but there are no uh, labeled edges here. So the edges are undirected and they are not labeled. What about this kind of graph then? So these are this is an example of a knowledge graph in front of you. So I'm not going too much into the basics of the knowledge graphs and reasoning. So I'm treating it as a directed labeled graph right now. So each of these nodes represents one entity. And then there is a directed edge towards another entity. It can be in any of the direction. And the relation is here is also labeled. So uh, here, these, this knowledge graph has right now the connections within itself. So the entities are also existing within that knowledge graph. However, they also connect to other knowledge graphs like DBpedia, Wikidata, these kind of uh, existing knowledge graphs. And then this gives rise to this web of data. So here in front of you, you see this, uh, this uh, link it open data cloud. However, in this one, each of these circles that you see are not nodes. This is one of the data sets. And each of the colors that you are seeing here, they represent one domain. So here, this one is the biomedical domain and the gray thing that you see here between the nodes, uh, between these uh, circles are the connections between these uh, data sets. So here it is dense, here it is pretty sparse if you see. So the idea here is to learn knowledge graph embeddings. What do we do there is that we project these entities and relation. This is the gra graph that you see already into the low dimensional vector space. 
So what happens here now, you can see these uh, labeled entities here, like Last Supper, Mona Lisa, and Vitruvian Man, they are actually occurring close to each other in this vector space. So this has also the scoring function and the loss function. I'm not going to do too much into the detail of that. However, you have one survey article which is summarizing and categorizing all these methods which have been proposed until 2017. And there have been many methods afterwards also. So there is another updated uh, uh, survey on that. So what, where do we uh, apply these knowledge graphs? What kind of tasks do we solve? There are two. One is in KG, so like completing the knowledge graph where these low dimensional vector spaces are learned. And then there are out KGs like recommender systems or uh, knowledge reconciliation, which I'm going to talk about later on. So uh, these kind of places where these uh, algorithms are applied. So these tasks are also used for uh, performing hyperparameter optimization for these um, algorithms. However, again, I will not go into the detail of that. So uh, one of these knowledge uh, graph completion tasks are the triple classification here. So given a triple, so this is one triple here. This, these are two entities, this is head and this is tail because the direction is in, in this uh, way. So you have Leonardo da Vinci occupation artist. Now the algorithm has to tell you if it is true or not. So it is like a binary classification here. So you have yes with some score here. Then we have a head prediction. So the head is missing here and we are given the relation and the tail information. Then we have tail prediction where these two things are given, but the tail is missing and what algorithm does. So I'm not going to tell you all of them except for the last one later on. So what happens here is that the algorithm gives this answer for these, uh, these kind of tasks, these kind of uh, like, like the question marks that I uh, put it here with some scoring function. So here you can see that you have Leonardo da Vinci, there can be other artists, uh, sorry, other kind of uh, yeah, other artists. Then there is uh, the occupation, there is this, uh, what could be the relation between them and then the type of this, uh, this uh, entity. <clears throat> so uh, in real life, what you actually encounter many times are the multimodal knowledge graphs. So here you have the structural information, like you have entity relation and another entity. However, in many, time, in many cases, you have this uh, image information. So um, also you have this uh, birth date or creation date or any kind of numeric information or the description of these entities. So now what is the use of this kind of extra information? So if uh, there are two entities uh, which are close to each other, uh, so because of the birth date, Leonardo da Vinci will be close to another uh, artist which for who the birth date is uh, close to him. So possibly it would be 1451 or something like this. So this way, this kind of extra information is going to help us improve these knowledge graph embedding al algorithms here. <clears throat> so here, if you want to know more details, there are several algorithms again proposed for this. More details are here. So we have recently published one of the surveys for this, and we have uh, categorized all the algorithms according to the literal type. So this is what we call literal also, like numeric, textual, or image, uh, and you can have all the details there. So now I will take one uh, real example here where the information is actually missing. So here you have, for example, the movie, which is Inception for which the starring information is missing in DBpedia, one of, in one of the knowledge graphs. So this information is actually given inside this uh, description of this entity, which is like film stars Leonardo DiCaprio. And then we can use this information to predict this link between these two entities. So what did we do for that? So now I'm going to talk a little bit about our own research that we have done uh, in this uh, direction. So we uh, proposed one algorithm, which is called Medlink. And here are the details of this, uh, but I will try not to be too uh, technical uh, and too deep into this. Um, so uh, the idea is that uh, you, uh, for the words 
in the vectors, you say the word is known by the company it keeps. So here the idea is that the entity is known by the company it keeps. So if you see the neighboring entities of one entity, you will have no more information about it. Here you can already see that, you know, he's the writer of uh, Inception. So what we did to get this information, uh, we actually tried to perform some random work starting from these entities. And then we got the contextual entities. So contextual entities are the surrounding entities of one entity. And then uh, it was based on uh, three, four hops, because if you go farther away, you will also see that it will start becoming more and more irrelevant. Then to, in order to uh, not let the algorithm explode, we also performed some PFITF to uh, crawl only few uh, of the relations around the entities instead of crawling all of them. So after we have these paths after the random box and PFITF, so we are adding, uh, so we are feeding this information to attention encoder decoder, which at the end provides us some vector representations of these paths starting from a head entity. We did the same for the tail entity. And then for the entity descriptions, we generated uh, our uh, vector representations with the help of SBIRT. Of course, you can plug in several other uh, language models, Roberta, there are many other uh, language models which are proposed after that. And then we have finally uh, these uh, vector representations for these uh, uh, descriptions. We combine these vectors and then we combine it with the rest of the information for the head relation and tail. And then finally, we pass it to a scoring function. And then we computed our um, results on uh, link prediction task that I defined in the beginning. I'm not going to go into the results. This was just to show that uh, we have already performed ext extensive experiments here. We are still performing few. And then um, our uh, proposed algorithm was performing better here. So after uh, doing this kind of um, uh, work, we also realized that the, the data sets which are already existing there are not really suitable for this kind of information like literals. Uh, so you have to take the existing benchmark data sets and extract this information, which is somehow sometimes not very complete. So in our work, what we did, we started from the numeric values, like you have longitude, latitude, you also saw birth date, these kind of things from Wikidata. And then we went one hop backwards and then we generated our whole uh, data set again. So I'm again going to pass through a little bit faster from here. And then um, we generated several sizes of the data sets and then we uh, divided them into train, valid and test data sets. So here are the statistics. So as compared to the existing uh, uh, benchmark data sets, we considered all their flaws and uh, everything that was uh, supposed to be uh, considered. So there is, of course, our paper published, all the details and the analysis are already there. So here, what I would like to mention is that you can see that the proportion of structured and the attributed triples, by structure, I mean where you have nodes connected to other nodes, and by attributive triple, we have nodes connected to either images, numeric, or uh, textual information. So in this, in this work, we did not um, consider the image information yet. So this is what you, you can uh, have a look at here. And then we have, we performed several analysis over our data sets. So we had connectivity, diameter, and density. Uh, so uh, this way, we, uh, you can actually see that the di density is decreasing because uh, the uh, the graph is larger here in this case for the last data set. So here we built it for debugging purposes. Here we built it for the for evaluating our algorithm. And this one we built for the scalability purposes of the algorithms. Finally, we also made it multilingual. So we considered English, German, Russian, and Chinese languages. And these numbers uh, are in percentages. So 100% of the entities had the summary in English in this data set and so on. So D is German, R U is Russian, Chinese is uh, ZH here. And then for each of the entity relation and attribute, we had labels, aliases, descriptions, and this is also in percentages here. So finally, also we, uh, we 
performed many experimentations here and we are still doing it. So I will just give you the intuition here that um, on the left hand side, we wanted to show that using literals actually improves these um, the results of the knowledge graph embedding algorithm. So you can actually see here, here we have better results with these um, extra information. On the right hand side, it shows that it is harder to perform better on our uh, benchmark data set. So this is easier because they contain some kind of symmetric and inverse relations, which makes it easier for link prediction, but I will not go too much into this detail. So you can have a look at the paper here. So finally, I will uh, discuss uh, some of the downstream tasks here. Um, so where are they actually used? So uh, first of them, uh, first of all, there is entity typing where we are going to use language models and Wikipedia category embeddings. So I go back to this uh, Link it Open Data Cloud here. So I told you that there are many domains which are covered here. So here there is DBpedia. So this DBpedia is cross domain, which is there for interoperability and many, many, almost all of the data sets are connected to this uh, DBpedia. Now this DBpedia is actually generated from uh, the info boxes of Wikipedia. So here you have the genre information, which you see on DBpedia also, there is the genre information and this information is given here like this. So now the problem with uh, DBpedia, since uh, the, this is automatically extracted from these info boxes, we have some incomplete information. And what is that incomplete information? So here uh, you see one of the paintings. We all know as humans, when we look at it, this is one painting. But DBpedia here says that this is a thing here. So this is the most general type that is there in the knowledge graphs that could be assigned to some entity. However, you might have seen many Wikipedia categories here. So here you can actually see that in these Wikipedia categories, you have a lot of information. So 19, uh, sorry, 1498 paintings, paintings of the Last Supper, so on and so forth. So you have all of this information. What we intend to do is to consider this information that is given in this uh, Wikipedia categories. Also, we want to consider the structural information of these categories. So I will tell you how we extracted this uh, structural information also, as well as uh, these uh, this kind of uh, lexical information within these Wikipedia categories. So here um, we generated a category 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 graph. So how was it generated? If two categories had common entities between them, we created this link between them, and then uh, we assigned weights to these links. So they, these are the node embedding algorithms that I talked about right very much in the beginning. So we assigned weights if uh, according to the frequency of the entities which were common between them. So after generating this network, we ran few uh, node embedding models on this and we obtained the category embedding there. So these are the vector representations generated from this network. And then we had Wikipedia categories. Now we want to use the lexical information. Now we want to get the vectors for these, uh, these kind of words that are in, inside this uh, Wikipedia category. For that, we used BERT. So BERT considers the contextual information of this whole uh, two, three, four words that which are there for the Wikipedia category. And then we used word to vec glove and Wikipedia to vec here separately, of course. And we experimented with all of them, actually. And then uh, we uh, obtained our category embedding based on their uh, lexical information. And finally, after combining them, so we concatenated these vectors and we got this entity vector. Now this entity vector was further used for different kinds of classification. So we perform multi-class classification and multi-label classification. And we treated this as this classification problem. And finally, we were able to perform our type prediction. So again, I'm going to show you the results, but I will not go into the details. Uh, so we tried several um, uh, variations, as I said before, and then we performed uh, better in these cases. All the analysis is already given in the paper that is given here. 
So another downstream task, for, uh, task is mostly uh, towards uh, natural language processing. Uh, so uh, we used it for event-based knowledge reconciliation using frame and role embeddings. So this work was done in 2017 when I was in uh, LEPN. Um, so here the idea was that you, you uh, extract this, uh, or how can I say it? You generate this consolidated view over uh, two or maybe more than two knowledge graphs. So how do you do that? I'm going to discuss this later on. Uh, I mean, there are, there are existing algorithms which are performing graph compression, graph alignments, these kind of algorithms to do that. And then in our algorithm, what we did, we use the frame and the role information. So these graphs can also be extracted from text. So I'm going to quickly introduce you to uh, this tool which does that. And then uh, we performed some reconciliation based on the frame and role information. I will also introduce you what does it mean by the frame and the role information here. And then I will also introduce a little bit of the results of uh, this study that we did. So let's start with the first part where we generate uh, knowledge graphs from text. So the idea here is to use the event information so here you see, this is one of the existing tool, which is called Fred, which actually does that already. Um, now you have one sentence, sentence here, which is uh, Spaniards attacked the Incas. So here you have, uh, for example, attack, which is this word here, which gives you the event information in the sentence. So the verb actually gives you the, this uh, event information. And then the agent of this is the Spaniard and the theme is Incas here. And since Spaniards, it's plural, there is multiple here. This is the quantifier. And then finally, these entities are further connected to other data sources like dbpedia, schema.org, or here you said Dolce. So these are the foundational ontologies. So they are uh, all semantically rich knowledge graphs out of text. And then now I'm going to introduce what does it mean by frame and the role information that we used. So frames are coming from FrameNet, and each, uh, each of these frames actually talks about one event. Here in, the, in front of you, you see uh, reshaping. So uh, reshaping is one event where you take some object and then reshape into another configuration. So here in this, uh, here in this picture, you see one example. So you have crumpled, which is the lexical unit, which is evoking this uh, frame reshaping. And then there is the deformer, which is Alan here, who is uh, doing some crumpling, which is the event, I just said that, to a paper. So paper here is the patient, this is the role, into some configuration here. So he, this way you have several roles uh, which are belonging to one, uh, one uh, frame. And then you have several lexical units which evoke these frames. There are many other roles, of course, cause, for example, the person who is reshaping the deformer could be absent in the sentence. So you have like the strong wind which is causing the deformation. And then there are few of the um, optional uh, roles here. So we considered this information and we generated our knowledge graph out of it. So you have frame here and then the roles of these frames. So R1, F1, and then you have necessary external optional roles. And then there are one frame, uh, one frame is actually connected to another frame with some relation. So we connected uh, all of this into uh, one knowledge graph. And then we have the subsumption hierarchy of this frame. So we represented all of this into this linguistic linked open data cloud that you see here. And uh, here was the uh, frame semantics that I just talked about was considered in this hub of Framester. And then we connected it to the other data sources like WordNet, uh, BabelNet. I, I hope, I think many of you have heard of that. And then we have ontological resources. We have other DBpedia, Yago, Nell, RDF, these kind of resources and some of the sentimental resources. So uh, finally, what we did in our uh, work of knowledge reconciliation, now I go back to that, uh, is this. So we generated knowledge graph embeddings out of this linguistic linked open data cloud and we used the cosine similarity for reconciling the knowledge graph into one. 
So here you have red ones, which were already existing from the existing data sets. In this case, we were able to produce more links through, with the help of frames. And then we were also able to um, link the edges together from two different graphs. And then finally, we performed our evaluations on the cross domain co-reference resolution. So here, what we actually uh, do in cross domain, uh, cross document, sorry, uh, uh, co-reference resolution is that uh, in this task, you associate the nodes from two different knowledge graphs. It can be object person or concept, it can be anything. And these knowledge graphs are actually uh, generated from text. So finally, we have our baseline here. And then we uh, tested our approach on um, path-based similarities. So these are WordNet based, but we uh, developed them for the frames also. And then we uh, compared it also with these uh, vector-based similarity. So here you see the optimal results that uh, with the optimal uh, parameters. So here in all these cases, we were performing better and we have extensive analysis on these results also because uh, sometimes with the taxonomies, you need to use different kind of knowledge graph embedding algorithms. For example, there are uh, hyperbolic uh, knowledge graph embeddings. Uh, so uh, yeah. So these are the results of our study. If you want to know more details, of course, please go ahead and uh, look at this uh, journal that we published in 2017. <clears throat> now I will discuss one of my last um, applications here. So this is about a knowledge aware document representation for news recommendations. So this is th not the study which is actually done in our lab, but it, I thought it would be really great to discuss this uh, and show you how it can also be used in news recommendation system. So here on the left, what you see is that the knowledge graph which is extracted from text. So entity linking is performed, which means the entities are identified in the text. And then the relation extraction is performed. It can also be verbs. It can be uh, any way. There are several algorithms for that. And then this knowledge graph you can see is used here. So here you have news document from where they extracted this um, knowledge graphs out of this. And then they are using these um, embeddings which are about, uh, which are entity embeddings, they are category embeddings, position embeddings on which position are they occurring in the sentence and then the frequency. And all of this information is coming from uh, several, uh, uh, from this uh, news uh, documents, from this one news document, not several, sorry. And then uh, this information is further than used for recommendations. So these are combined with this, uh, uh, with the embeddings of the users. So, so many times uh, it also happens that you have some network of the users uh, to who you want to recommend something. So you can generate your uh, vector representations from that network also. So this is just an, uh, one of the example that I wanted to mention about where these knowledge graph embeddings are used. So here in case, uh, just one thing I forgot to mention before is that you have knowledge graph attention uh, network, which is used here. So this is different from what I have introduced before, but this is uh, giving a very good uh, information uh, as a background to uh, these recommender systems. So uh, I think I'm on time here. And uh, just to give you the, overall view of what we discussed in this whole uh, talk is, first of all, we talked about knowledge graph embeddings and its application to an NLP task that was uh, event uh, and knowledge reconciliation. And then we also uh, saw something about entity typing and also uh, news recommendations. So what is missing here is uh, there are not too many work which are done on the domain of cultural heritage. I have seen one or two of them. Uh, but possibly I'm missing something. How, uh, however, it would be really interesting to do that, uh, to apply this to, uh, to the cultural, cultural heritage domain. So here I discussed some other applications of the knowledge graphs or knowledge graph embeddings, which could be useful for cultural heritage domain also. So for example, question answering of like conversational agents where the humans can interact with some uh, other um, 
some machines to know more about the painting or answer some questions. So there are some work on visual question answering in cultural heritage domain, but they were not using knowledge graph embedding. So I did not mention here anyway, but uh, there are a few uh, studies which are doing this already. Then we have uh, also, we can uh, perform some uh, explainability in these recommender system with the help of knowledge graphs. So I think I will close my um, lecture here and thank you very much. <laughs>